I want to begin a study this morning that will one sometime, the Lord willing, into the future. Regarding the matter of fellowship, I want to make it as biblically basic as I can, as if we had never studied it. I'm primarily starting out with the idea of how do we come into fellowship with God and what does that mean? So I want to talk about the meaning of the word fellowship. If we go to the original Greek language, it comes from the Greek word koinonia, and it basically means a sharing, a participation, a, a togetherness. And of course, we're speaking about the need of men who are lost in sin being once again in fellowship with God. Romans 3.23 makes it exceedingly clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. The idea of death simply is separation from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they immediately began to physically die. But immediately at that moment, they were separated from God. The fellowship they had with him before they sinned was destroyed. And the whole Bible reveals the scheme of redemption down through the stream of time as to how God would reconcile lost man to himself and he still remain a perfect, just God. And of course, it's in the gospel system of which we shall have more to say later. I would like you to think of fellowship from this standpoint. When you think of a ship, and we still say they are sailing, even though not many sailing ships of large size exist today. That terminology coming from the days of wind-powered vessels still holds. We recognize that everybody from the captain of that ship down to the lowest seaman and everybody in between, other officers and men, have jobs to do to sail that ship from one point to another and safely do so. Jesus is called by the writer of Hebrews the captain of our salvation. I know of really no other position of authority any more powerful than the captain of a ship. And if you want to see just how important that is to the Navy or any other captain over a ship, according to law, is to have a mutiny and overthrow that captain and see the punishment that is meted out to those guilty of a mutiny. So we are interested in recognizing that fellowship is a ship of fellows, all laboring under one authority to sail that ship and to do so safely. The ship of Zion is the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And so we occupy positions in that ship of Zion. And all things are to be done according to the authority of the captain, Colossians 3.17, decently and in order. Now, with those preliminary remarks made, I want you to recognize that I will, in this study, be presupposing that certain propositions are true because I can't spend time We'll be here forever and trying to prove each one of them. So I'm assuming this about this audience, or at least most of you, that the one true and living God exists. That the Bible is the inspired word, infallible and authoritative word of God. That the Bible is complete it allows for no additions to it, subtractions from it, or modifications of it. As John closed out inspiration in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, he said, if you add to this book, then the plagues of this book will be added to you. God is the sole legislator. He does not want people messing around, if you please, with the Bible to suit themselves. Paul made that clear in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, concerning false doctrine that had been brought among those teachers. Some were coming, teaching a gospel different from what he had taught to them. 
And he said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. American Standard Version 1901 says anathema. It means cut off from God. That's what God thinks of false teachers. The other thing that we are, or at least one of the others that we're presupposing, is that the Bible teaches both explicitly and implicitly. And the next is that what it teaches implicitly is just as binding on us, just as obligatory, just as authoritative as what it teaches in just so many words or explicitly. And then I'm also presupposing that the Bible, therefore, being the inspired Word of God, does not make mistakes. It never states that to be the case, which is not the case. What it says is true is true, and what it says is false is false. Now, a very careful and close study of the Scriptures, which I hope is the attitude you have when you approach the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15, reveals that God has at least two laws relating to the general topic of fellowship. Remembering what I said about fellowship in the beginning. We will have occasion throughout this series to refer to these. Uh, we'll spend more time on the first one today. And the first one is the law of inclusion. The law of inclusion. And the second one is the law of exclusion. So in this sermon, this study, I'll be concerned with these two laws. The law of inclusion and the law of exclusion. In other words, man sinned and separated himself from God. How does God work it so he can be included in fellowship with God again? Included. God has the law for that. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Which simply means whatever I believe must be taught by the Bible. I know that many people today say, I believe thus and so. What they really mean is, I think this to be the case. But when the Bible talks about believing in Christ, or faith in Christ, and all things pertaining thereto, it means the Bible teaches it. And thus, when we say, well, I believe this, and I can't find it in the Bible, then I don't need to believe that. That's part of what's meant in the scripture above my head, that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. To do anything in the name of anybody is by that person's authority. If you go out here and try to do something in the name of the United States government and you don't have that authority, you get yourself into trouble. And if uh, somebody tries to do something in your name, who does not have the proper credentials to act in your name, then they're going to get themselves into trouble. So we're interested in God's law of inclusion. Man sinned. He's lost. If he dies in that state, there's no hope for him. So God has authored a way whereby we can be included with him again. That's a marvelous announcement. And you should begin to see then that in the Great Commission... To the apostles, when Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Paul writes in Romans 1.16, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We know why every creature needs to hear the gospel. It's the power of God to save. So we would think in those glad tidings, that good news of Christ, that the uh, law of inclusion would be being announced. Because people are in sin, they're lost and undone. I ask you to read Acts chapter 2, where there in Jerusalem, following the resurrection of Christ, the church began. And the first recorded gospel sermon is found there as Peter stood up with the other apostles. And you'll find out that he announces God's law of inclusion. And we shall talk more about that as time goes on. I think it's important to get before us early in this series of studies, the fact that while it certainly is the case that uh, through the Bible, the Word of God, 
that there is a unity that is upheld among God's people. Jesus prayed for such in John 17, 17 through 21, praying that we would all be one even if he, is in father, he and his Father are one. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth by inspiration, rebuked them for division, and he condemns that division. It was sinful division, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Now, I know those things to be a fact. I can read it and understand the Word of God. But this must be understood also. All unity, or what passes for unity as men announce it, is not acceptable to God. All you have to do is read Revelation 2, verses 14, 15, and 20 to see that Paul, or that uh, John, and Jesus by the Spirit through John, was not happy at all with the kind of unity that they were engaged in at that time. Also, it should be obvious from a complete study of the Bible on unity and division that all division is not condemned. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 through 16, and Romans chapter 16, 17, and 18, while those verses are saying you cannot stay associated with people who are not what God says they ought to be. And he'll even say, come ye out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Well, as far as I know, if you obey that, you come out from among them, that's division. So I must be careful in the right division of the word of truth to know there is a unity that is sanctioned by God and expected of us and taught in the Bible. And there's a unity that's false. That there is a division that is right and there's a division that is wrong. We'll find occasion to refer to these two truths as we go along through this series of election, uh, lectures. Now, as I said, we will spend the rest of the time on God's law of inclusion. The Bible plainly teaches that we are to recognize as God's children and thus those who are in fellowship with God. I underscore the next word. Only, only those who have done what the Bible teaches is necessary to attain such a status. When you see Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus in John 3, 3 and 5 during our Lord's earthly work, you'll see that he's pointing out that you cannot be what God wants you to be in fellowship with him simply by being a descendant of Abraham and keeping the law of Moses. You must be born again. And he tells him then in verse 5, you must be born of water and the Spirit. And he says, if you're not, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty plain language. And then when you look at Galatians 3, 26 and 27, here are these churches that he addresses. And he makes it very clear that they were, upon their faith, baptized I-N-T-O into Jesus Christ. Well, you don't go into something if you're out, out, not already in it. You have to be outside to go into it. And he says we're baptized into Christ, and there's the doorway. We're looking at God's law of inclusion. Now, we need to ask some questions. What does the Bible actually teach regarding the very point at which men reach or they attain fellowship with God and therefore with all others who are in fellowship with God. Now mark this down. We as Christians do not want to be in fellowship, Christian fellowship, with any person not, not in fellowship with God. We do not want to exclude from our fellowship those who are in fellowship with God. We want to be in fellowship with all men who they themselves are in fellowship with God. Now, it's certainly not the case that one, as time goes by, attains unto this fellowship when he becomes either an atheist or an agnostic. An atheist says 
the evidence is in, and I know God does not exist. The agnostic says the evidence is insufficient, and I can't know whether he exists or he doesn't. Well, you know that such a person as that is not in fellowship with God. If you consider carefully the teachings of such passages, Psalm 14, verse 1, and Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, believing it to be God's word, you'll understand why. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And then in Romans 1, 18 through 32, Paul describes the Gentiles departing from God, losing their fellowship with them because they desired not to retain God in their knowledge and they went their own way and God let them. Then what about those that reject Jesus as God's son? Well, we'd have to simply say they certainly can't be in fellowship with God. Because the Bible makes it abundantly clear in such passages as John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, and John chapter 8, verse 24, that you must believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And to the Jews, unbelieving Jews, Jesus said, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. I don't think that's too hard to understand. And I know he said what he meant. And he meant what he said. For he would also declare in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, that's either the truth or the life. Also, it's certainly clear that one does not reach or attain this fellowship when he reaches the point that he claims, claims to believe in Jesus as the, oh, he may call him the leader of Christianity. Great, good man, maybe the best of all men, but simply a mere man. In other words, he's rejecting the deity of Christ. Well, that needs to be broken down some. How does one do that? There are various ways you can reject the deity of Christ without just explicitly saying, I do not believe in the deity of Christ. One of them is, is to deny his pre-existence. His pre-existence, so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, deny that he's co-equal with God and that he's God. They say he's simply the first of God's creation. But the inspired apostle John said plainly in John 1, beginning verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the same was God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of course, the same is declared in various places, such as Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. There's also the rejection of Christ's virgin birth. Now, that had been prophesied of the Savior, that he would be born of a virgin 750 years before Jesus walked this earth by Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And the fulfillment of that is seen in Matthew, the apostle's writing, inspired by the same Holy Spirit that inspired the prophet Isaiah in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. So he was born of a virgin, not through normal procreative processes. Then that he lived, uh, denying that he lived a sinless or perfect life. Yet the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that he was perfect and sinless in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. And so did the apostle Peter in writing to Christians in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. They deny the deity of Christ when they deny his vicarious, his vicarious death. That is, because he was sinless, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, as John the Immerser announced him to be. He was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He could go to the cross and die on that cross, not as a consequence of any evil he did but for our sins. He could die on behalf of others 
the perfect Lamb of God. Acts 2, 22 through 30, there the day the church began in Jerusalem. It's one of the first things Peter's sermon declares is that's exactly what he did. And it's, uh, as I said, brought out through the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 2 and verse 9 for one passage. If you deny his resurrection from the dead to die no more, then you're denying his deity. Paul spends time correcting false teaching in the church at Corinth on that very point. Some had said there's no resurrection. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, Paul says there was. In fact, he says, if Christ be not raised, we are of all men most miserable. Where is our hope? Where is our expectation if Christ is not raised to die no more? And Paul pointed out to the young preacher, Timothy, not only for him to know, of course he already knew it, for him to be sure he preached it to other people in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 18. You deny the deity of Christ when you deny his final authority in all matters of religion. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now this is a lot of people who say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Bible is the Word of God. Why? Because they go after some other authority other than New Testament authority to form their beliefs and to approve their obedience. That is acceptable to God. You remember that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. Well, why would he do that? Because he's emphasizing his authority. Who gave it to him? The Father. What were they to teach? Well, they were to teach that they were to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mark's account of the same thing says that baptism is for the remission of sins. Or Acts 2.38 does, and Mark says, believe and be baptized and be saved. Now, you can quibble over all of that you want to, and it won't change those words. Jesus still says it. The Bible's still the Word of God. And you can say, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He's the Son of God. But then not submit to His authority, and you're denying, really, by the way you live or not live, that He is deity. We need to understand that when people deny that He ascended to heaven, and was coronated on the right hand of God and is now ruling and has been for almost 2,000 years over his kingdom. Remember, Peter declared that plainly in Acts 2, the day the church started. Mark 16 and 19 and Luke 24, verse 51. As I say, Peter said so in Acts 2, 22, 36. Now remember when I say Peter says so or Paul says so or John said so, that's God by Christ through the Holy Spirit saying so. There's nothing in your Bible that calls your name and says this applies to you. You know it applies to you because it's addressed to all men. And you're one of those uh, men, if you please, or of mankind, male or female. And it applies to you. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. What about those who refuse to obey Christ? I've touched upon that, really. But they certainly are not going to be in fellowship with God. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. He really leaned heavy and hard on those of his day who called him Lord, Lord, but did not do what he told them to do. Why, he said, do you call me Lord, Lord, in view of what that means to call somebody Lord? And do not the things which I say. And I ask that of every human institution called a church. Why? Call Jesus Savior without intending to follow the Bible and the Bible only. For it and it alone makes Christians only and the only Christians. And there's a multiplicity of verses we could add to that. Such as one must, having heard the truth and believed in Christ, one must repent of sins, Acts 17, 30 and 31. One must confess one's faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9 and 10. One must be born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 3 and 5. Repent of sins and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. 
as a believing, penitent person, be baptized to wash away your sins, Acts 22, 16. And that's not the water washing away anything. It's being baptized into the death of Christ where he shed his blood. And it's his blood that washes our sins away when we obey the gospel, Romans 6, 3 through 5. And as I said earlier, Romans 6, 20, or rather Galatians 3, 26 and 27, we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. So we are interested in abiding by the truth. In fact, Paul tells the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1 what's going to happen to those when he comes who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. And he says they'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Folks, I don't want to be in that position. God doesn't want anyone to be in that position. And as Peter says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. And thus we preach the truth on God's fellowship. Fellowship with him and then the grounds of fellowship with all others who are in fellowship with him. So just when or at what point in one's obedience to God does he attain Christian fellowship? Surely we've already picked up on it by the things we've studied. The Bible plainly teaches that one becomes a child of God, that is, reaches fellowship with God and with all others who are faithful to God when in obedience to Christ's instructions. They're set out in his last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible. He is immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the remission of his sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 12. So from these passages, I think it's clear that before one is baptized, in obedience, he's not in Christ. All those outside of Christ who are accountable to God for their beliefs and actions are children of the devil. Salvation, Paul said to Timothy, is in Christ. 2 Timothy 2.10. We heard a good lesson from Charles on that this past Wednesday in the devotional. One's not a son of God till they do what God said do and the way God said do it and for the reason God said do it to be in fellowship with God. And we've seen when that is. So we have to put on Christ. And until we put on Christ, you may say it this way, we are still dressed with the filthy rags of our own sins and until we are freed from those sins and stand reconciled to God in fellowship with Him, we stand before Him condemned. Now the question arises, can we be faithful to God and not honor His law of inclusion? Can we as Christians, as that term is defined and used in your own New Testament, be faithful to God while extending, to use biblical terminology, the right hand of fellowship to some who have not been baptized in accordance with Bible teaching. Quite obviously, Bible teaching indicates that these questions demand a resounding no. Now you say, preacher, that's being awful tough. Do you have a Bible? Do you believe God tells you what's right and wrong in that Bible? Well, if you don't, why do you have it? For what purpose do you study it when you do? What do you expect to get out of it? How is it to direct your life? You have to first of all follow what it teaches. And we've done that in very plain, simple language in this lesson on God's law of inclusion. Christian fellowship, as we see it in the New Testament, cannot be extended, that is with God's approval, to those who are not Christians for what I think is a very obvious reason, that one who has not been baptized into Christ is not yet a Christian one who has not been baptized into Christ is not in the kingdom of God, not in the family of God, John 3, 3 and 5, and Galatians 3, 26 and 27, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. 
Children of God do not have the authority nor therefore the right to extend familial privileges to those who are children of the devil. Oh, I know you say, well, I, I know folks who are very pious and they believe in the truth of the Bible that Christ is the Son of God and yet they deny that baptism is essential to salvation. Then they're still children of the devil. It doesn't make a difference how well they dress, how well they smile, how many Bibles they've got at home, how many human churches they attend. And by human church, I mean those founded on the commandments and doctrines of men. They're still children of the devil. You see, that even grinds on some members of the church because, let's face it, we kind of get tainted too sometimes in determining things solely and only by what the Bible says. To attempt to extend Christian fellowship to those who are children of the devil is to do nothing less than rebel against God. It's to dishonor God's law of inclusion, which entails that only those are to be regarded as in the family of the living God who have obeyed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Such action is nothing else than rebellion to God. And we can learn from the Old Testament, he will not for one moment tolerate that kind of rebellion. Listen to what you learn, and brethren used to know these passages. In 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, these things written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, speaking the Old Testament message, Romans 15, 4. Here Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of ram. Now listen. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee as king, as Samuel spoke to Saul concerning the sins Saul had committed. Now as I come to the last part of this lesson, I say this to every member of the church, that every child of God be strongly warned that there are some and have been for many years among the Lord's people who would have us reject, number one, the distinction between children of God and children of the devil. But if you were to go find what God's viewpoint is and uh, how he draws those lines, wouldn't you go to the Bible to know the difference in a child of God and a child of the devil? How would you know you needed the saving uh, grace of Christ and the gospel if you couldn't identify yourself as lost and undone and in sin and thus a child of the devil? Well, what works for you, God expects to work for everybody to be able to identify themselves as sinners, lost and undone, servants of Satan, and in need of belief and obedience of the gospel. Number two, the distinction between the Lord's one true church and the denominations founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men, every one of them owes their origin and maintenance to nothing higher than human authority. We cannot blur that distinction that there are so-called pious believers, unquote, around us. I would not deny. But we sing God's law of inclusion. In fact, those of us being members of the Lord's church for years, if we've been under good faithful preaching and teaching, we knew what I preached this morning long before I preached it today. We need, and I don't have time to do it now, to consider carefully where Jesus got all over the Jews of his day for teaching their traditions and setting aside the commandments of God. We see Paul warning the church as he closes out the book of Romans to beware of these who came with good words and fair speeches. They were not servants of God, but they served their own belly. And then John makes it clear in his one chapter book, 2 John 9 through 11, that we are not to fellowship those who teach false doctrine. If we do, we're partakers of them. Well, those words have to mean something, and they have to be applied to my life and yours. There are those who, among us who seek to bring believers in Christ into Christian fellowship simply upon the basis of what has been around for years called unity 
in diversity in matters of what one must do to be saved from sin and remain faithful. That is, you just select one thing. Well, let's just say, we'll just believe in the God of the Bible. Everything else, it doesn't make any difference how much we disagree on it. Or some others might come down and say, well, you need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Then it doesn't make any difference what else you believe on anything else. Just do it, and we're all okay. Well, you can't find that taught in the Bible. If you can, we'll all embrace it. But it's not. So how do you know? I can read the Bible. And God expects you to read the Bible. He expects you to study it. Why? You're only here but for a short time. You don't know when you're leaving. But wherever you, uh, whenever you leave, you're going to the place that you'll never leave. And how we live here depends on what shall be there for us. I, in my younger days, was exposed to a number of false brethren. They started Mission Magazine. Some of this will be strange to some of you. Well, it's not to me because as a young man, I was there when it happened. I witnessed it and dealt with it myself. Mission Magazine, Integrity, which was anything but Integrity, all set out to teach what I just said. That doesn't really make much difference what you believe if you believe that Christ is the Son of God. Different ones such as uh, Carl Ketcher's side has been dead for a long time and Leroy Garrett, who was a companion who died not many years ago, both produced papers, Mission Messenger for Catcher Side and Restoration Review for Garrett. And every one of them was simply saying that you can just accept all these other things and it's all right just so you accept Christ as Son of God. I say again, if that's what the Bible truly teaches, then we ought to embrace it. But we're going to have to determine the Bible teaches such a thing before we even begin to think about embracing it. But I read the writings of these people they conclude that if you really love God, everything else goes by the wayside to have a false concept of love. Because the Bible says that love leads to obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And that's the way that it is, because that's what Jesus said. For those who stand essentially of the one, for the one plan of salvation, the one church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the essentiality of true Christian worship and living the true Christian life as is set out in your own New Testament. These men have, and others nowadays, after all these years they permeated the church, they have set out all manner of bitter remarks. They can love everybody but us. It's like the fellow said, you can't take the Bible and correct somebody with it, but he doesn't mind trying to take the Bible and correct me with it, even though he misuses, rest, and twist the Bible in attempting to do it. They're inconsiderate, or in, well, that too, but they're inconsistent, to say the least. What we remember, or what we must remember, is that there is a law of inclusion, and we've studied it this morning. And we know that in our efforts of unity, there are going to be some fallible things. We're human beings. But it doesn't change, and I'm going to close on this. It doesn't change what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, that we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, that can be understood, and it can be applied, and God expects us to do it. For that will be in the book divine as it judges us on the last great day. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him on the last day. I suggest that we take whatever there is remaining in our lives, whatever time we have, and pour our lives in the study of God's word and the honest, objective evaluation of our life in the light of these truths that we truly will know whether we are in fellowship with God and whether we ought to be in fellowship with everybody else who's in fellowship with God. We've studied what to do to become a Christian. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent. It's God's second law of pardon. Confess your sins and pray God for forgiveness. And now we stand and sing this song of invitation to encourage you to do so.